Thank you. My name is Gary Bennett. Uh, I've known Bill for a number of years. Uh, Bill and I worked with some churches in Arizona. I lived there about 15 years, and this is many years ago. So Bill and I have. I'm a transformation ministry pastor, ABC pastor, so that's how I know Bill. And um, I live in Yukaipa. My, my wife was here last week, and uh, I'm a retired, yes, retired Navy chaplain. I just returned from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, for, uh, just about six, eight months ago, and that's where I retired from the military as a Navy chaplain after 28 years. Uh, and I'm a public school teacher in West Covina. Uh, so continuation high school. So I have a lot of hats and uh, I just got back from the men's retreat here at the ABC Conference Center, Transformation Ministry here. So I just went downhill five minutes and uh, changed my clothes and took, took a shower and uh, my car is very dirty because of all the, you know, the pine cones and everything, but uh, I had a good time up there. There's a story that's told about uh, a factory manager, assembly line was down, and so he summoned a consultant to suggest remedies. And after expecting a huge piece of machinery, the consultant produced a small hammer and went back in the back of the machine and just tapped something. And the machine started up immediately. About a week later, the, uh, the manager got a bill for $10,000. He was aghast. The manager demanded another bill itemizing the charges. And when it came, the second bill read, tapping with hammer, $5. Knowing where to tap, $9,995. <laughs> you know, wisdom is knowing where to tap, right? This is why we pay expensive lawyers, expensive plumbers. They know where to tap, right? clueless where I know where to tap, but they know where to tap. And we're going to talk this morning about getting God's wisdom and knowing where to tap in life. I went on a w website and uh, the stupidest criminals in the world. Let me tell you about a few people. Christopher, he's really stupid. He's a 22-year-old that was arrested in March while Snapchatting his whereabouts. He was currently hiding in the cupboard he snapshot his location to the police, <clears throat> and immediately he got arrested. He wasn't too bright, right? He was kind of a stupid criminal. Uh, John Morgan uh, had made, already made a poor decision about getting, this is another person, about getting face and neck tattoos of his crime, and he posted his wad of a bills that he stole with his girlfriend, his girlfriend was in the picture too, on Facebook. How stupid can you be? He was arrested immediately, of course, and he had all the evidence right there. He was kind of stupid. There's another man who named John. John in uh, New Hampshire, he broke into the home and he had an intent of robbing it he opened the refrigerator. You got the point here, right? He started to get hungry. So he ate some, some of the food and he decided to take a nap. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, the owner came home, called the police, and of course they arrested him. He wasn't too smart, right? There's some not too smart people in the world. Let's talk about people about gaining wisdom from God. In my verse, my, uh, my scripture, uh, some people are just are not too smart. Uh, do we have an overhead? My favorite person in life is Homer. I use this, now I'm a continuation high school student, teacher. I, I use this as an example of Homer's brain. Uh, do we wanna be like Homer? Now, I like Homer. I watch The Simpsons every now and then. The beloved Homer, who is a beloved doofus, you know, if you've seen the program. And his brain is not too brilliant, right? He, he just does some stupid things, right? If you've seen the program, right? You know, Homer's brain is just not too large. And God doesn't want us to be like Homer. You know that? The brain and the heart is connected. Now, I know you think emotionally the heart is the emotions, but really, all the emotions all the intelligence, all of life experiences are in this thing. And a lot of times we have a pea 
up there and kind of shakes, rattles, and rolls up there like Homer. And God says, I don't want you to be like a Homer. Let's turn to an example of uh, 1 Kings. Uh, give me a second here. 1 Kings and in chapter 4 about Solomon. Solomon had wisdom. Where do we get wisdom? Wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 4, 29 to 34, if you have Bibles. And I'm going to read this to you. Uh, it's a story of uh, King Solomon at Gideon at night in a dream. And Solomon prays for wisdom to govern the people of Israel and to know the good from the bad, the right from the wrong. God is pleased with his request and God gives him wisdom to him plus riches and honor which he did not ask for plus long life if he walks in the ways of God. Now the verse of scripture is 1 Kings chapter 4 verse uh, 29 to 34. And I'm, after this, I'm going to turn to uh, Proverbs. So just if you have Bibles, keep your Bibles open. It, it won't be too difficult. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 4. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great, great insight. The breath of understanding as measureless as a sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men of the east and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than any other man, including Ethan Israel. Wiser than him, men, Kalkal and Darda, the sons of Mahal, whoever they were, I don't know. His fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He, now listen to this. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs numbered 1,005. He described plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He was a scientist, we would call him today. He also taught, he was a teacher, about animals and birds. He was a biologist, reptiles and fish. Men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Think about Solomon, all that wisdom that God had given him. In fact, it was greater than just wisdom. It was knowledge of understanding of things that people didn't even know back then. Think about Solomon, who was a wise man. He was a philosopher. He was a sage. He was a rabbi. He was a proverb writer. He was a songwriter. He was a singer. He was a naturalist. He was a biologist. He was a scientist. He was a poet. He was a governor. He was a leader. He was a ruler. He was a politician. On top of that, he was a husband, father, spiritual leader, and a naturalist. We would call him today a, a renaissance man or woman. A renaissance man is someone who's sort of like Leonardo da Vinci. You know who Leonardo da Vinci is? I'm sure you do, right? Uh, he was ahead of his time. He painted and he sculpted, he designed, and he created drawings of like war machines and submarines and things that were way events of his time. Uh, he, uh, Solomon was a renaissance man. You know, it's sort of like being, like putting in one brain, one heart. Steve Hawkins, you know, the guy in the wheelchair who talks about black holes. Paul McCartney, Beatles, you know, uh, uh, Bob Dylan. You know, the Beatles only made two, two to three hundred songs. Did you know that? Uh, Solomon made how many? A thousand and five. Hmm. Putting George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, you know, Star Wars and Indiana Jones film filmmakers into one brain. Putting Ein, Albert Einstein, you know, the guy with the funny hair and E equals MC squared and all that into one brain. It's, it's like putting Jimmy Carter, I like Jimmy Carter, as a Christian, he was a Christian, after his presidency, dipl diplomacy and peace agreements. It's putting Jacques Cousteau and marine biologist who started the aqua lung in the uh, diving gear and, and Tiger Bo Woods to boot in sports. All in one person. Think about all those people, all in one brain, one heart, one mind. That's Solomon. You know, I could think of a lot of personal examples, and they're embarrassing since I was in high school. You know, high school can be rather embarrassing sometimes, you know? <laughs> oh. And they're not necessarily sins. They're just embarrassing things that you said or did. Oh. Or, uh, you know, I, I think of people ask me about the military. They're shocked that there's a brig. The military has brigs, you know, prisons. And as a chaplain, you go visit them. And there's a lot of 
Marines, Navy, Coast Guard. It doesn't matter who you, they are. Now, they're the minority, and I understand. They are the minority, one or two percent, that have made stupid decisions in life. Smoking, doping, and murder. Yes, I've met a couple murderers in Briggs in Hawaii. You name them, rape, bad stuff, bad stuff. Now, they are the minority, but they all regret what they did. AWOL. A lot of them are AWOL. Stupid. Just show up to work. But they decided not to show up to work, the military, one day. And so guess what? Or they decided not to jump on board the ship and the ship left. Another stupid decision. And so they get, they get in trouble. Um, what are your examples? Now, I'm, you know, anyone over 20 years probably has lots of examples. I'm not going to go there. I just read a book. It was a long time ago, and I last when I was in Gitmo, uh, about the book of Eric Clapton. He was a rock musician, and I know I'm bringing real con trying to bring contemporary examples here. The guy was addicted to everything, drugs and alcohol, wasted relationships, numerous children from numerous women, terrible relationships with everyone, and he says, this is awful. Never really knowing himself until he was about in his 40s, and he said, I need help. And he got on his knees and started a, joined a 12-step program, got reformed. Stupid decisions, and he just regrets in this book. Stupid things I did. Why did I do that? Just think, if he had wisdom and knowledge and understanding of God, or just not to do those things, he would have not wasted that 40, 45, 50 years of his life. It comes on goals all the time. Wisdom, what is wisdom? There is a difference between, of course, knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is necessary. Head knowledge uh, is necessary. Head knowledge is apply, had knowledge is necessary. Wisdom is the application of life to your heart. But we know nowadays it's all up here. You know, it's all up here. It's, the, it's our thought life. It's our emotional life. It's our brains, if you can say. It's our heart. Our heart is really up here because this is where we make decisions and, uh, and we worship God. It's, it's up here in these, 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 these things that connect with our hearts and our minds and our brains. Turn to the book of Proverbs. If you have Bibles, Proverbs 5, 1, chapter 1, Proverbs is right in the middle of the Bible, right in the middle of the Bible. I'm going to read these verses of scripture to you. It says, let the wise listen and act to their learning. Hmm. It would think that someone with a PhD would stop learning. But he says, listen to the wise, let the wise learn and listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. You would think they would know enough. But God says, excuse me, you don't know enough. You're still progressing in life. You still need to develop that brain and that heart of yours. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Someone with a PhD can despise fool, uh, despise knowledge and wisdom by ignoring God and stopping learning or stopping personal growth. Proverbs. And today's pro, uh, proverbal statements, we might say a penny saved is a penny earned, or a, he's kind of short, he's kind of a, he's kind of a few bricks short of a load. You know, we see all these little proverbs. But really Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, is really, and the wisdom literature of Solomon, is not just popular sayings like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's really a distillation of wisdom from those who know God and the word of God to keep them from sin. Did you know that's why we are to get wisdom and knowledge? It, it really, Eric Clapton needed, needed not to do any of that stuff if he just read the word of God. We don't need to do stupid decisions like those stupid criminals. If you just read and realize it's not right to steal from others. You know, we need to get this. Why? It prevents us. It helps to prevent us from sin. And not that we don't sin. We do sin all of our life. But it, it, it helps us to stay away from that stuff. Now, a few pre preliminary uh, uh, ideas. First of all, godly wisdom comes from God. 
I just read Proverbs chapter, or if I didn't, I'm going to read it again. Turn, if you have Proverbs, turn to chapter 2. You can just stay in Proverbs because I'm just going to go through, through a few verses here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. 1 to 7 states, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for her wisdom, for it, ask for silver and gold, and search for it for a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk in blamelessness. Especially look at verse 6 and 7. Notice, God is the foundation of all knowledge and wisdom. You thought it was the internet. You thought it was the library. You thought it was uh, science. Oh, science loves to think they're, uh, they're God. I mean, it, it drives me crazy. They just think that, and they change their ideas every day, but they just think they've got the answer. Science is the answer. God is the source of all knowledge. He's the source of mathematics, religion, science, history, philosophy, biology, government, family, medicine, psychology, spirituality, astronomy, you know, the stars. He's the knowledge of everything, the source of everything. All the university disciplines, and if you go to a university handbook or, you know, uh, catalog, you know, they have hundreds and hundreds of BAs and MAs and PhDs. God started it all. It all begins with God. All knowledge, I don't care what it is, medicine to science to biology to music, it all starts with God. He knows it all. Okay? Number one. Uh, secondly, godly wisdom brings peace, honor, riches, and security. Think about it. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, 13 to 18. We've all kind of alluded to this. Is it chapter 3, Proverbs 3, 13 to 18. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Blessed is a man or woman who finds wisdom, the man or woman who gains understanding. For he, she, is more profitable than silver. Ooh. Wisdom and knowledge is more important and profitable than money. Better returns than gold. Interesting. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and her left hand are riches and honor. Hmm. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. You get blessing with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Think about all those. Now, I'm not beating anyone up, please. I'm not beating anyone up. But, but think of those, all those who die early because of bad habits. Cigarettes, AIDS, alcoholism, I could go on and on. And they, they wish they had a second chance. You've seen those commercials on TV. You know, the, the lady in the, with the hole in her voice, she's pleading with us, don't smoke cigarettes. I was stupid. Don't do it. Don't do it. If we had that knowledge and understanding not to do certain things and refrain from them or to do certain good things, we would have a happy life, a happier life. I'm not saying we're perfect, but think of all those dysfunctional living patterns and families that you've known, and are, 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 they, it wouldn't be there, or less there, I should say. They all die early without peace, without honor, and so forth, because of bad choices. A lot of times we make bad choices, and, and we just don't have that knowledge or understanding to do the right thing, and so we don't do it. Or we don't seek counsel, help, encouragement, direction, counseling, whatever. We don't look for the answer here. We, and so we do something stupid and we pay for it. That is what wisdom and knowledge is all about. Because it prevents us, it, it allows us to live a more functional, happy, blessed, <laughs> prosperous life. Without all the dysfunctions and addictions and stupidity that is in the world. You, does it make sense to you? 
Does it make sense? Okay. Now, there are four steps to godly wisdom. I make this real simple. F-A-D-A, like ta-da. It's F-A-D-A. Number one, first step. How do we get this? Number one, we fear God. We just read this. Proverbs 1.7, if you're in Proverbs, repeats this repeatedly. The fear of the Lord is a beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdoms and discipline. Amazing how many people that I know they have PhDs that think there is no God. Okay, they've limited themselves in a little box about this big, and they haven't opened the door that's fast more expanding, and they don't realize that little box, a God, it's God's in that box. And that started with God. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Turn to Proverbs 8.13. It says about the same thing. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and ignorance, every evil behavior, and preserve per perverse speech. Now think about it. If we fear God, we hate evil. Fearing God is obedience to God. That's what it is, really. Now, fear, we think fear is, you know, like darkness and, ah, I'm, I'm afraid. But really, the original idea of the word fear is fearfulness, awesomeness. Uh, it's an idea of worship. It really comes from an idea of worship, awesomeness, and fear, a fearsomeness of who God is. Not that God would zap us, but that he is so holy and just and big and beautiful and all-knowing that we can't not but fear him. So that's really what it comes from. And the concept here is that fear of God is reverence, homage, fearfulness, worship, allness, wonderment. How do we fear God? I just ex explained by obedience to his word. That's the beginning of it because if we obey God, we, if we hate evil, we obey God. And when we obey and truly fear God, we will obey him. Turn to 1 John chapter 3 if you have Bibles. Keep your hand there in Proverbs. It's right in the middle. But if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 John. It says uh, chapter 2, verse 3 to 6. 1 John is in the New Testament, the, just before Revelation at the very end. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, 3 to 6 if you have Bibles. And I'm just going to give you a few seconds here. It says, we know that we have come to know God, him, if we obey his commandments. The man who says, I know him. Now, this is hard. This is hard. The man who says, or woman who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a, wow, liar. And the truth is not in him. If anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Wow, you thought love was an emotion. And it is an emotion. It's, I understand it's an emotion. It's an experience. But really, this is saying... Love is really just obedience, doing what God tells you to do, or not doing what God tells you not to do. I know that's a double negative. But uh, if we think we love Jesus and we are stealing, it's, I'm sorry, it doesn't equate. That's what God says. It's really not an emo it is an emotion, and, but and also it's an obedience. It's a logical step to do the right thing, to obey. Wisdom is loving the good by hating the evil and therefore obeying God. When we truly hate evil and all its vileness, we will love the good, which is God. Make sense? You understand? Okay, number two, second step. Ask for it in faith. We don't ask, and we don't ask for it in faith. Now, you don't need to turn to this, but I'll read it. You probably have heard this verse before, James chapter 1, if you want to turn to it. If any one of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him, just like Solomon. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. It's simple, but why don't we ask for it? We need to ask for it. Jesus says we do not have because we do not ask. We, we need to ask. And especially, forgive me, especially in emergencies and difficult situations. Now, I, oh, I had my display model here of Homer's brain here. This is Homer's brain. Uh, 
by the way, take that slide off for a second. I don't want to confuse anyone. This is a home, you know, we need to develop this. This is like a muscle. I know it's not a muscle. But it, 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 it's, this is Homer's brain. And Homer's brain, needs, our brains and our hearts need to be bigger than our real brains and our hearts. So, so the, the, we need to ask for this. We do not because we do not ask. But a lot of times, e yes, even when before a planned test in school, when we could have really studied. <laughs> yeah, that's not the way to do it. See, the brain is not like God doesn't open this brain and takes a picture. <laughs> Okay, you're done for life. Good luck. He doesn't do that. Yeah, he starts the process. But this brain has to grow. It's called personal growth. Personal, spiritual, psychological, emotional, intellectual growth. Okay? Yeah, it takes reading a book instead of watching TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it takes. Uh, God has, he, he does start the process, but remember Solomon, he was a scientist, right? He was in biology. He was a musician. How many times did he correct a verse? He'd go, eh, you know, that doesn't rhyme. Mm, let me think about that. Let me fix the, he, he had to figure the music out. He had to learn the music. He had to sing, ah, oh, I'm out of tune. I better practice a little bit more. Uh, I need some more knowledge and understanding about that decision, about that, but with my that uh, relationship with the, the Egyptian pharaoh. I need to, can I? I need to get my advisor. In other words, God didn't dump it in there. He had to go out and search and get advisors to help him in the decision-making process. Oh, uh, let me read that book, the first book of biology. I don't know, whatever back then. Oh yeah, plants and animals. Hey, you know what? I I gotta dissect that bug. I got to learn more about that bug. So it was work. I'm getting ahead of myself. But what do we do? Remember, the, it's ask, asking in faith. Remember the Raiders of the Lost Ark when Indiana Jones steps out in a vast empty cavern in faith only to see an invisible bridge. Remember that scene, if you know it? He's Indiana Jones. You know, he, he's going to jump. He, he has to get on the other side of the cavern. He can't see anything. And he, he goes sort of like this. And there's a mag a, 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 an invisible bridge, right? And then he takes sand, and he throws it on there, and there's the bridge right there. And all he had to do was walk. And he walked straight across. He had to walk out in faith. And a lot of times, we just need to walk out in faith and ask in faith for wisdom and knowledge. Okay? Ask for it. Uh, but again, remember this brain... God wants you to develop it. He does it just, he will in an emergency, trust me, because we do get there. But third step, dig and work for it. It's work. It's not simple. Proverbs chapter 2, go back to Proverbs chapter 2. Listen, my son, if you accept chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, if you call for insight and cry, cry aloud for understanding, if you call out for insight and cry aloud, cry for understanding, you will look for it as for silver and gold and search for it for hidden treasures. Within you will understand the fear of the Lord and the fear of the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Turn to Proverbs 8, 10 to 11. Choose my instruction instead of silver and knowledge and gold. Knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare to it. Turn to Proverbs 8, 17 and 19. I have a lot of Proverbs here. If you, if, I can give them to you later if you want them. I love those who love me, and those who are seek me find me. With me, he's talking about wisdom. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. It takes work to get there. Right? Now, I grew up in Rich Crest, China Lake, California. Anyone know from Rich Crest, China Lake? Do you know the area? Okay, I grew up there. If you're, if you're from there, please talk to me afterwards. And if you go to Rich Crest, there's these old mining communities, Jan oh, Johannesburg and Randsburg. And these guys, you know, they, they dig for silver and gold. And they have to dig the size of this room to get one little piece of silver or gold. And they get rid of it. And they see these mountains of... Um, excess dirt and junk. 
That's a lot of work for this little piece of gold. You got to do the same thing. Wisdom and knowledge is not easy. You got to get it. You got to you got to dig for it. It's not easy. It doesn't come overnight. These people are not wizards overnight, and these pe- Billy Graham didn't come Billy Graham overnight. It was a process, a growth. He had to dig for it. Examples. There are a lot of examples, and I'm going to go on forever on this. Ex- observation of life. That's gaining wisdom. Learning from the mistakes of others. Learning from the victories of others. That's getting wisdom. That's digging for it. It doesn't necessarily need to read the Word of God. That's important. We'll talk about that in a second. Listening. Whoa. Reading a Christian book. Counseling. Uh, I've been to counseling. Anyone been to counseling? I'm okay with it. It doesn't bother me. If I have a need, if I think that I need someone else to help me with it, I'll go. There's nothing wrong with Christian counseling. Get over it. It's okay. It's my personal growth, spiritual growth. It's okay. Travel, scripture. And remember, scripture, when I was a missionary in Marshall Islands, I was young. And it was only me and another guy. And I, you know, you had to be fed. And I remember getting a, forgive me, an old transistor radio. You know what those are, right? And trying to get the dial to get a radio, Christian radio station in Hawaii to hear some sermon from Billy Graham or whoever. Trying to nowadays, you can do that instantaneously. We have no, we have no excuses as Americans, none whatsoever. We have Christian radio, we have Christian books, we have Christian DVDs, we have Christian everything. You can go anywhere, get it. You can get, get it on your cell phone. You got it. You have no excuses. You have 30, 40. I have probably. 30 to 40 translations of the Bible itself, different translations. You have 100 translations of the Bible. There's no excuses about getting them. You have study Bibles. You have different, you have everything. What's the excuse? And if you don't, if you can't read it, I understand that as an educator. Some of us don't like to read, and I understand that. Some of us has dyslexia or whatever. There are ways to learn from a DVD, hearing it, listening from the sermon. Hearing, listening, I can go on. I'm going to say others. Heroes, mentors, accomplishments of others. Reading, studying, memorization. The computer, yeah, there are Bible software games. There's music. Instead of just singing the music, you can sing it and read and meditate on the words. Oh, that's a shock. That's why I like hymnals. You can open the hymnal, and it's poetry set to music. I don't know if you know that. It was originally poetry, and they set it to music. So if you study, meditate on the words, that's part of growth. That's personal growth. Worship with other Christians at other churches, small groups, accountability groups, Sunday school, listening to the sermon, not falling asleep. I know it's hard sometimes. It's uh, having a critique, uh, not a bad critique, not complaining about the pastor or the worship band after church on Sunday, but reviewing it. What did I learn from that sermon? I better write that down because I want to remember it. That's part of personal growth. That's part of learning. That's part of digging for it. Allowing others to feel for us, to to be vulnerable, to go to counseling, to go to a men's retreat, even though I don't need to necessarily go to a men's retreat. I did it in a way because I thought it would be good. How about this? Less of TV. Ugh. You know, we are Americans, um, and I, I've learned this. I've lived in foreign, four foreign countries for nine months to a year with the military or as a missionary, and I've learned that we are spoiled. And uh, we love to be entertained. We really do. If I don't entertain you, you will, you'll just fall asleep. The man sort of doesn't entertain you. you we tend to, we love football games, we love basketball games, we love to be entertained, we love sitcoms, we love everything to be, we have this entertainment mode as Americans because we're spoiled, we've been entertained, and there's a book called Entertained to Death. <laughs> and the point of that book, if you read it, is, is that people don't read anything. <laughs> they love to be entertained, and because of that, we have a very superficial understanding of really nothing. Uh, uh, and if you read the book, just read the book. Don't, don't, don't get me in trouble. I'm not beating anyone up. I'm trying to ex- explain uh, the ideas of that growth factor of digging for it, traveling. 
Yeah, you can travel, small mission group, or take a class in a Bible college, take a, take a college class even if you're 81. It doesn't matter. Grow. Read the newspaper. I don't know if you know, but the typical newspaper is on edu reading educational list, reading of 7th and 8th graders. Did you know that? That's shocking, but it's true. Because they know the average American can only read, or is only readable, entertained with seventh or eighth grade reading level. That, you know, and, I, and I, I'm not beating anyone up, trust me, I'm not beating you up. But reading, and, and there's all sorts of ways to dig. You gotta dig for that gold, you gotta look for it. It's more precious than a lot of stuff that we think is important, money and all that kind of stuff, and, and what's on, important on, uh, you know, the latest sitcom or whatever, Hollywood and entertainment. There's a lot more important things in life, and that's getting wisdom. Why? Back to that premise. We get and gain and dig for wisdom. Why? Because it helps us to be less dysfunctional. Helps us to be more, less likely to sin. Because we know we don't want to be like stupid next door who started drinking and, or whatever, driving, or d has a disbelief in God or whatever. Because we learn from their examples, and good examples, all the good examples. There's lots of good examples. Jimmy Carter, for me, because to me, he's a Christian. And I really like, after he became presidency, all the good things that he did in presidency. But let's move on. Um, let's move on. My people are destroyed of lack of wisdom. Let's turn to the next uh, uh, slide. I'm going to move on here. You know, the slide, Jesus, um, uh, the fourth step is, uh, the fourth step is a pl application. We need to apply these things to our life. It's pointless to have all this knowledge up here and apply it. Now, look at this. I, this is my, my, my theme of life. I've had this idea forever. I'd, someday I'd like to write a book on this. Jesus, Luke 2, 52. Jesus kept increasing... Notice what it says, in wisdom and stature. That's physically. He, he got taller. <laughs> he took care of himself physically. Oh, God forbid. He didn't go to the gym. I didn't, don't mean that. Because they didn't have gyms back there. Yeah, they didn't have, well, they did. They're Roman gyms, which you had to bow down and worship a Roman goddess or something. You had to walk around naked and just stupid things. But in wisdom and stature and in favor, Notice this is in favor with God and men. In other words, he grew, he grew, we would call it today in the psychological, spiritual realm. He grew, he grew up, he grew. You know, have you ever met someone who you go, oh, he, he's kind of different. See, I really don't think if you walked up to Jesus 2,000 years ago, you, you could say, oh, he's kind of different in a bad way. You would probably go, wow, he has his life together. He's kind of normal. He, he really has a balance of his body, mind, and spirit in relationship with God and others. In other words, he had good relationships with people. He had good relationships with God. And he put all this together. He had a balance. He ate well. He, he, he spent time in prayer and worship. He, he read books, the mind. He was balanced, a balanced individual. He was not like Homer Simpson. You can come up to, and I know he's the son of God. I know, I understand God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But I really do think if the Pharisees and Sadducees came up to Jesus and had an open brain, they would have gone, wow, he's kind of normal. He's kind of healthy. He's kind of has his act together. Wow, maybe I better listen to him. You know, you, you, if you come up to Jesus, it's not like you go away, whoa, oh, okay, you got some problems, buddy. No, I think people saw him as a normal, healthy, functional human being. I know he's the son of, as, as a, body, a balance in body, mind, and spirit. And his relationships with God, of course, number one, and with others. Yeah, I know people got mad at him, and I understand that. He worked with it. He worked with difficult people. Okay, let's move on. Um, 
thank you. That's the fourth step, application. Do not, you know, James chapter 1, I'm going to move on. James chapter 1 says very clearly, do not merely listen to the word to deceive yourself. Do what it says. If any man looks in the, at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like, but that man who looks intently in the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed what he does. I, and I'm, I hate to bring a gross example, but I was a teenager. I had some very severe acne all my life until I was about 30s. And, you know, looking in that mirror as a teenager, I, I, I had to do something with that. And finally, I just was praying to God to heal me and said, Mom! She said, you're going to the doctor. And the doctor, God healed me through the doctor with tectocycline. And there's nothing wrong with that. God healed me. But the point that I'm making is if I looked in that mirror, forgive me, and didn't pop that white head, it was pointless to have that mirror, right? Right? What's the point of a mirror if you don't fix yourself? If you, don't app if you read the Bible and, you, and the Bible says something, and you, okay, fine, thank you, God. You walk away, don't do it. What is the point? The, this is a mirror. When we look at it, we gaze into it. We are to do what it says or not do what it tells us not to do or whatever. This is a mirror. And if we, we have to put the application to life. Now, the last verse of Scripture, maybe, hopefully, is 2 Timothy. Everyone turn to 2 Timothy, my last verse of Scripture. 2 chapter, Timothy chapter 3 and are we good for time? We're still good. Okay, a few more minutes. Uh, is this the, the scripture about, um, about the word of God? It says very clearly, uh, chapter, chapter, second chapter, chapter three. Um, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching. Notice what it says it's teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. For the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice what it says. It's for teaching, reproof, correction, and training. When I read the word of God, I, God is teaching me. I'm reading the word of God. God is teaching me. And when, I get, and when I get off, oh, I get distracted. He reproves me. Then he corrects me. He says, Gary, stop doing that. And then he goes on to train me in righteousness. That's what the word of God is for. You walk in, life goes on, and then you get tempted, and you might get distracted and sin, and, but God slaps you or whatever. He can, brings you back, and then you continue in the ways of God. That's what the word of God is for. And if we don't read it or glean from it methods of growing this little brain, we're not going to get there, friends. One concluding verse or it's really a saying. By three, mem uh, methods, uh, by three methods, methods, we may learn wisdom. First, by reflection, which is reading or study and meditation, reflection. Another wrong, listening, hearing the voice of God, listening to counsel, writing it down, memorizing scripture, getting help when you need it. I've been to counseling, it's okay, I'm not crazy. Which is the noblest? This is a quote. First, by reflection, which is the noblest. Second, by imitation, which is practice. These people could not be up here unless they practice, right? That's the second way. By practice, which is the easiest. The third is experience, which is the bitterest. See, now there's some experiences that are good. And, you know, it doesn't cause a lot of... Bitterness. And I, we're getting maybe buying a new house in Ukaipa, my wife and I, and we get counsel from a real estate agent, and, and we've done this before, so it's not like we, we're stupid about it, but they're brighter at it than we are, and our experience will be better, our understanding of it. But there are some experiences that are not good, and we, we get dysfunctional lifts, live, living, dysfunctional uh, past sins of all sorts of stupidity and it's a bitter thing until 20, 30, 40 years later like Eric Clapton he said this is stupid I wasted my life for whatever 30 years being a drug addict 
I got to get on my knees and say, I need help. And so I think, like I said, if we do that to begin with, we don't have to go through all that stuff because we will be like Solomon. We will be like Jesus because we're growing psychologically, spiritually, ethically, morally, educationally, you name it, in multiple ways, and we're growing in balance in relationship with God and others. Make sense? Okay, next slide, and then we're going to stop. I already said that, right? Uh, uh, the growth of wisdom, it produces a godly heart. It grows with application of that wisdom for desired changes. It's like the Grinch who stole Christmas. His heart had to grow. And the only way that his heart had to grow, he had to grow uh, to his heart was too small, right? Remember the story? His heart had to get bigger. Our brains and hearts had to get bigger. Next slide. Conclusion, four steps. Fear God. Ask for it. Dig for it. Application. I'm going to have the worship band come up real soon, Paul. Uh, are we Homer? No wisdom. Are we the Grinch? No application. Let's close and pray. Father, be with us now. Move very powerfully, and we pray that, Lord, we have a great offering and worship time together. And uh, we pray that we make application to the sermon. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.